Hey guys, how's it going? I hope everyone is doing well and stuff and welcome to my very first build video of 2020. In this one we're going to be making a triple jointed battle scarred crucian carp which your eyeballs are feasting right at this very moment. And uh, well, yeah, without further ado, let's just uh, jump right into it and make this thing. As we all know, every new lure starts with a design. And I remember spending obscene amount of time re-sketching and redoing the whole profile of this bait. You know, I'm sure I'm not the only one who is a perfectionist like this. And when you look at a sketch and you just go, eh, that just doesn't look quite right. And I think it was probably my sixth or seventh attempt on the sketch. And I was like, okay, enough. This is going to be good enough and I'm just going to make it work. Now that I've traced the shape of my carp to a piece of maple, I can start sawing off the pieces. I gotta say, this belt slash disc sander combo is probably one of my favorite tools that I've acquired in 2020 since I moved to Canada. I mean, this thing is so convenient that I don't think I could ever go back and not use one of these things. So I guess I'm getting spoiled here. So the next step is going to be gluing these two identical halves together and the reason for that is twofold. First of all I will get a very clean center line that I can use later on to achieve the uh, upper profile and make sure that it's actually symmetrical. And secondly, carp tend to be kind of chunky so I wanted to make sure that I have enough wood to be able to achieve that chunkiness. Next I'm going to start making the upper profile for my bait and for me to achieve that accurately I'm just going to make a template out of this piece of paper. So basically what I do, I'm just going to fold it in half, uh, draw out the shape that I want to make and then cut it and boom I have a identical template. And then it's quite easy for me to uh, transfer that into the piece of wood that I'm going to be carving. Now, since the bait is still sort of like a block at this moment, this is the perfect time to make the joint cuts. So what I have here is two pieces of um, wood that have been clamped onto the bait that have a 35 degree angle and I have my saw blade wedged between those. This way all of the cuts are going to be uniform. Also at this point I figured it would be a good idea to start making the tail slot as well. Next I'm going to start shaping the upper profile of the bait. But first things first, I need to cut off the excess before I can start sanding anything down. Now that the excess wood has been cut off, I'm just going to finalize the shaping with my disc sander.
This next step probably doesn't seem like it's very critical, but it actually is because I'm going to be using these eye sockets as a point of reference to all of my details that I'm going to be carving onto this bait later on. And if I misalign either one of these eyes, all of my details are going to be misaligned as well. And I definitely don't want that to happen. Now I'm going to start shaping the bait and I'm going to start by doing chamfers around the bait with my disc sander. There were a few spots on the bait that I couldn't get to with my disc sander, so I'm just going to use my belt sander to take care of those problem areas. For the final touches I'm just going to use my knife and then later on some sandpaper to round everything off. Alright, and now we're on to the carving portion of this video. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to basically cut up this uh, drawing that I made and I'm going to use these parts as a template that I'm going to be able to then use as a guide to help me trace out all of these details with a pen. Now that I have all of the details drawn on, I can start carving them out. And I'm going to start by cutting along all of the uh, lines that I have drawn onto the bait. Here is a new trick that I haven't shown to anyone yet. So what I'm doing now is I'm erasing all of the pencil marks that I still have on the bait. And what this does is it forces some of the graphite to actually go into the grooves that I just carved, thus making it much more easier for me to see all of the cut lines and making it way more accurate for me to carve anything. For this wind bait, I wanted to have an open mouth design. So what I'm doing now is I'm gouging out carefully a mouth opening with a Dremel tool. Alright, let's start revealing details and carving out the head. And I think still to this day the most frequently asked question about carving to me is what sort of blades do you use? And the answer for that is, and probably always will be, it's going to be 9mm hobby blades and um, the type of blade that I actually use most commonly is um, Alpha blades made in Japan. I guess the main reason for me to use these hobby blades is that they're super convenient to use. I mean, whenever I get a dull edge on a blade, I can just snap off a piece and I can continue carving. I mean, you can't really beat that. And also, I feel like these... Um, these blades kind of suit my carving style too, if that makes sense. I mean, I'm sure that there's other brands out there that are perfectly uh, well suited for this sort of stuff too, but I just stick to what I know, I guess. Now, I know this next segment might seem a bit odd, Am I sanding the swim bath with a piece of wood? Um, 
technically, yes. But there's actually a strip of sandpaper attached to the other side of this uh, homemade jeweler's file, which I have actually made quite a few different sizes to work on different tasks when I do these uh, carving jobs nowadays. And they actually work really well. All right, next up we're gonna start carving the scales. And what makes this carving a little bit more different than my previous ones is that I'm gonna base the whole um, scale patterns or scale rows according to this lateral line. And what I have done is I've made a tool um, which is roughly at a 25 degree angle. Uh, I'm gonna use that to help me make the guidelines that I'm then later on gonna use as um, a grid to make the scales, which I'm sure many of you have already seen in my previous videos. And here you can see me doing the grid pattern on the bait that I will then use as a guide to draw on the scales. And I gotta say, finding the right angles when the um, when the grid are meeting themselves in the back is actually quite difficult, to be honest. But with perseverance, you can do pretty much anything when you put your mind into it. When I had the whole grid pattern made as perfectly as I possibly could make it, I then just started to draw on the scales. Carving out the scales is pretty much the same exact thing that I did with the head details a little bit earlier, so I don't think I really need to go into the nuances of how to do this stuff at this point. So what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave a little bit of a montage here of carving, because honestly it is kind of satisfying to watch. Those who have had a keen ear while watching this still remember that I was talking about earlier how I wanted the lateral line to be the determining factor for the grid pattern for the scales. And it should be pretty clear now why I wanted that to be the case, because now that I'm puncturing the holes for the lateral line, they're gonna be right in the middle of the scales, which makes everything look a little bit more realistic. And if you have been watching my channel for a bit, you really know that I'm into that sort of minute detail stuff. And I honestly want to just one-up myself every single time I make new baits. Now that I've finished carving the main body, I'm just gonna move on to the tail. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm just going to uh, use this little template to draw on the fin rays. Once the fin rays are drawn, I'm just gonna cut along those lines again, and I'm gonna start carving out the details. And again, to help me carve a little bit more accurately, I'm just going to erase all of the pencil lines.
Before the next stage, I'm going to just lightly sand all of these fin rays that I just cut out. To make this bait a little bit more realistic than all of the other baits that I've made before, I'm just going to add these uh, forks to the fin rays. This next part is a bit uh, nerve-wracking to say the least, because all of these forks in the fin rays are extremely uh, close to each other and uh, there's absolutely no room for error here, so uh, I was kind of freaking out when I was doing this, but in a good way. I gotta say these thin alpha blades really come into play when I'm doing delicate carving, such as these uh, thin fin rays. And um, these are not quite as thin as a human hair, but uh, they're kind of getting up there. Um, I mean, no, I'm not exactly David Bull at this point yet, but um, you know, maybe someday, if I practice enough. And then I'm just doing some final touches with my makeshift jeweler's file. And the sandpaper grid on this one was 400 because honestly I didn't want to screw anything up at this point and take off too much material. So all of the carving is done now and I can finally separate the joints. And I'm just gonna use my handsaw to do the job. One thing I need to do before I can start molding this thing, and that is to put hook and line ties to predetermined spots where I think they would work the best. And I'm just gonna start off by drilling some holes to those areas. To make sure that the hook and line ties won't come off in the mold, I'm just going to super glue them into place. And after all, these are just gonna be something to make an indentation into the mold where I can then later on attach the wire harness and weight inside. All right, let's start making the mold. For the mold clay, this time around, I'm gonna be using, shockingly, Le Beau Touche <laughs> uh, medium. I mean, uh, this is the mold clay that I use pretty much always. So, I mean, I guess I stick to what I know and there's no reason for me to change into anything else. So I just keep using the same stuff. After I filled the mold box made from Legos with mold clay, I'm just going to flatten it out as flat as I possibly can with this uh, homemade spatula. When I was happy with the flatness of the mold clay, it was just a matter of uh, burying the mold master halfway into the mold clay. As you can see here, there's still quite a considerable gap between the mold master and the mold clay. So I need to fill that out. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make some blobs out of this mold clay and fill out that void. And if you do this properly and uh, take time in actually making sure that the uh, seam is as flat as possible, you're going to have way less flashing when you actually start casting your lures. So we have one more step before we can start pouring the mold silicone into the mold box and that is to make locator holes. And I usually prefer to use uh, the back end of a drill bit, but obviously you can use whatever you want. Oh. 
All right, let's fill out the mold box. Um, I made some calculations before starting this on how much mold silicone I would need for a project of this size. And I came about 900 to 950 grams of mold silicone, mold max 30 to be more exact. And um, usually I try to have at least two centimeters or 1.5 centimeters of a wall thickness around the piece that I'm going to be casting so that I won't get that much flex later on when I actually start casting the pieces and I will get more accurate castings. This next step should be pretty familiar with people who have seen my other videos about mold making and casting lures, where I take a thin layer of mold silicone and pour it on top of the mold master and wait around five to 10 minutes for all of the bubbles to burst. So that way I get completely bubble free castings later on. Now that the first layer of silicone is cured, I can peel off the mold clay out from the mold and start making the other half of this two-piece mold. Before I can pour the other side of the mold, I need to make sure that I'm not gonna get a big pink break after this and uh, I need to have some sort of mold release agent. So what I use is nowadays mostly Vaseline. It's cheap, it's everywhere and um, works great. And also you kinda wanna make sure that you spend a lot of time doing this and not missing a single spot. Now that the other side is cured, I can finally open up the mold box and we can start casting some baits out from this mold. I'm pretty excited, I'm not gonna lie. Even though I'm pretty excited to start casting these baits out, I still need to make pour holes and cut some air vents into the mold. All right, here's a new trick for you guys for bubble-free resin casting. And what I do is I simply dust off the mold with baby powder. And this allows me to get almost 100% bubble-free castings. So obviously before I can start casting out these lures, I need to attach the internal Y harness and the weight inside the bait. And I actually never shown this uh, part before, so consider yourself lucky. All right, let's start pouring the swim baits. So first things first, I'm just going to measure out an amount of micro balloons that I have already predetermined that work with this volume of uh, liquid plastic that I'm gonna be using for this uh, swim bait. And I usually tend to keep that between five and 15% to the volume of liquid plastic that I'm gonna be mixing. If you tend to go over that, uh, the whole liquid plastic becomes brittle. For the liquid plastic, I'm going to be using Smoothcast 300. And this is a re really readily available product that you can find pretty much anywhere. And in particular, I like this uh, 300 model because it has a short pot life. 
uh, three minutes, which means you kind of have to move fast with this. But then again, the demo time is around 10 minutes, which is great if you are impatient like me. When I fool around with uh, liquid plastics and micro balloons, I tend to add the micro balloons to the part B of the liquid plastics, just because it tends to be a little bit more viscous than the part A, especially with the 300 smooth cast line. It just saves some time when you actually start pouring them into a different uh, mixing cup, which I actually didn't have this time around, which is, I mean, I don't know what I was thinking there, but usually I do have a different mixing cup. However, it doesn't really matter because everything worked out great. Once the liquid plastic has cured, I'm just going to trim off the excess and sand off some of the parts that are still kind of rough so that the um, swim baits are going to be ready for paint primer. For the tail section, I'm going to be using Smoothcast 60D, which is a semi rigid liquid plastic. So this time around, I wanted to try something a bit out of the ordinary because a lot of people I know use plastisol to make their tails out of. And from what I've read and what I've tested myself, this stuff is way more rugged and way more durable than any plastisol that's out there. The natural color of uh, Smoothcast 60D is kind of like this semi-transparent milky kind of thing so I just decided that I'm just going to uh, use some pigments to color these uh, tails out and black is a really good color so let's just go with black with this one So before I can start painting these swim baits with all kinds of cool colors, I need to make sure that my airbrush paint will actually stick to these things. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to um, spray some paint primer on these uh, swim baits. And I usually do this two times. And the type of uh, spray primer that you're going to use here doesn't really matter. All right, let's start slinging some paint. And I think the most important thing about getting focused and really getting your creative juices flowing is to find the right tunes. And I usually go with Symphonic Post Apocalyptic Reindeer Grinding Christ Abusing Extreme War Pagan Fenoscanian Metal. However, this time around, I think I'm just gonna go with uh, good old Pagan Metal. So, in that last update I released, I mentioned that I moved into using Vallejo paints. So, the whole painting process here is gonna be done with various types of Vallejo paints. And I don't think I really need to explain too much what I'm doing here. I mean, it should be fairly straightforward and easy to just follow what I'm doing and get a good sense of um, how something is done. Although there are a few parts that I think I'm probably going to jump in and explain why I'm doing something in a certain way um, and what have you. So enough yapping, let's start painting. And pretty much right off the bat, I need to jump in and explain why I am spraying this metal varnish on top of my lure. So a little bit later on, I'm going to be doing something called black wash, where I just basically smear on the black wash on top of my lure. 
and then I'm going to be wiping off the excess. And if I don't do this uh, part, uh, the metal paint that I just painted this lure on is going to come off. The way that black wash works is that when you come and wipe off the excess once the black wash has uh, dried, all of the low points are still going to be covered with this uh, black wash. So it gives you a really nice uh, highlighting effect, especially on the scales.
Pew! Now that we're done with the painting, it's time to slap on some ice. And I'm just using 5 minute epoxy the glue in the ice, which I already made previously. And unfortunately, the next segment I kind of forgot to film that, which was the uh, clear coating part. And for those who are wondering, I'm just using 2K uh, clear coat for these things. You know, the kind that comes in a spray can. And unfortunately, I forgot to film the whole process of how I joined the joints together with uh, with epoxy and uh, screw eyes. But this video is already uh, fairly long, so maybe that's a, that's a good thing. Anyways, um, now I'm just going to attach the tail to the tail section. And I feel like the easiest way to do this would be just to drill some holes and then pin it with, um, with uh, stainless steel pins. Now the only thing left to do is the traditional swim test. And if you had the stamina to watch all the way through, congratulations. I really had a lot of fun making this uh, really long and overdue project of this uh, Crucian Carp. Usually I would have a fishing test in the end of the video too, but let's face it, this video is long enough as it is. And if I would add a fishing portion here, it would be at least an hour long. And also there's a the fact that um, I don't actually have an action camera right now, but there's a way for you to help me out with that. By the time this video is going to be uploaded, there will be an auction for two carp swim baits, the one that you actually saw me paint here, and then another one that doesn't have the uh, battle scars. And that is a way for you to uh, help me out and uh, maybe get an action camera at some point. Or if you just want to support what I do here, that'd be cool too. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, like the video if you did, and you know, tell me what I should do next, maybe. So until next time, see you around.